Hello everyone and welcome to how to use new SQE pathways to qualify as a solicitor with BPP University Law School. My name is Aisha Hussain, I am Legal Cheek's Features Editor and it's so great to see so many of you joining us um, for today's event. So this is the fifth in the series of eight SQE events we're running this year in partnership with BPP. And if you missed any of the previous sessions, you can head over to the SQE Hub on Legal Cheek, um, where you can find the full footage for each of those four sessions, as well as related editorial and FAQs. Um, one of the team will um, link out to this in, in the chat um, shortly. Um, so I'm going to hand over to our panel shortly, um, but first I'm going to explain what's to come um, in the hour. So the SQE is creating um, new pathways into the profession for aspiring solicitors and a sort of flip side um, to that is students um, now have a great deal of, of choice um, and might be unsure about which path is right for them. And today's speakers, um, who I'll bring up shortly, um, are going to bring about some sort of clarity on what these routes are, um, as well as share advice um, so that you're able to make um, informed decisions. And so this is going to be followed by an hour's worth of networking in the expo. Um, and I'll explain how all of that works later on. Um, but just some general housekeeping um, before I bring on um, the event chair. So please, could you uh, make sure your chat is set to stage um, as this is where you're able to um, comment and ask questions um, to the speakers as the discussion um, goes on. Um, I'd now like to um, welcome on stage Johnny Hurst, BPP's Head of Outreach and Student Recruitment. Johnny is a former City Law Firm partner and um, your chair for today's event. So hello, Johnny. Good afternoon, Aisha. Lovely to be here again. Great. Um, so, Johnny, I thought perhaps I could kick off with, um, with a few SQE-related questions for you. Um, so as we know, the SQE has brought about um, big changes to the way future solicitors train and qualify, but perhaps you could start with um, a brief sort of overview of what the SQE is all about. That's great. Thanks very much, Aisha. I'm going to give you sort of an answer in a line, and then when we get the other speakers with me, we're going to go down into the weeds of it a lot more. And just to say thank you to so many people for raising questions in advance today. We're going to be uh, raising some of those during the session and hopefully taking a lot more. So what is the SQE in a nutshell, as, as Aisha asked? Well, it's the endpoint assessment, the solicitor's qualifying examination that all solicitors in the future or wannabe solicitors in the future are going to have to pass. Um, how you get there in terms of how you train, whether you train indeed, you know, in theory, you could just enter yourself into the exam and take it. That would probably be a foolish thing to do. But in theory, you could do that. But most people, uh, most sensible people will do some sort of course to prepare them for that assessment. So it's broken down into two parts, SQE1, which is um, two papers, all multiple choice questions, and paper two, which uh, was one and two. And then SQE2 is the um, skills um, assessment, which is uh, 16 oral and written skills assessments uh, spread over the course of uh, roughly three days um, that you're assessed on those. And you've got to pass both of those in order to be able to qualify. But alongside that, you have to have what we call QWE, qualifying work experience, which uh, I think uh, was, was that another question you wanted me to clarify before we go any further, Aisha? Exactly, Johnny. That was my next question to you. Um, could you tell us a bit about um, QWE? So as well as passing the assessments themselves, you have to acquire two years worth of qualifying work experience. Now, in the past, uh, many of you will know that uh, under the existing system, the LPC uh, students and uh, need to do a training contract, which is for two years, normally at the same law firm or employer. Um, QWE is slightly different. You still have to do two years worth of experience, um, but you don't necessarily have to do it after you've finished all your assessments. You could do it before you, the SQE assessments. You could do it alongside the SQE studying and assessments or leave it all to the end uh, after that. It's very flexible. And one very, very important difference is that you can acquire it in up to four employers. 
Um, and therefore, it makes it much easier to acquire qualifying work experience. Um, training contracts are very scarce in supply under the old system, but uh, a lot of people who are paralegaling now will be able to use um, a lot, if not all, of their um, time as paralegals, counting towards qualifying work experience. So um, it's going to be easier to qualify, certainly, under the new system with this much more flexible QWE. More about it later on. Great, thanks for that introduction, Johnny. Um, let's now get started with the panel discussion. So I'd, li I'd like to invite on stage two of Johnny's colleagues, um, Caroline Rayson, head of SQE programs at BPP, and Bruce Humphrey, head of legal apprenticeships at BPP. Hello. Thanks so much, Aisha, Hello. thanks so much. Great. So, so um, I'll hand over to Johnny now and I'll be back for the um, networking. Over to you, Thanks. Johnny. Fantastic. Well, uh, I think we um, better get introductions done. Uh, so, Caroline, um, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, we've we heard what role you do, but just you want to repeat that and tell us what your background is, and then the same for Bruce. Okay. So my background is as a corporate and city firms. Um, I joined BP about ten years ago as a tutor teaching corporate subject, and I am now the head of the SQE program. Thanks. Your sound's a little bit in and out, um, uh, Caroline. I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but uh, just to let you know that it's a bit in and out. Um, thanks very much, Bruce. Um, so you you um, you run the um, uh, apprenticeship program. So what's your status then, being here today? You, you are, I think, delivering uh, the SQE, aren't you, at the moment? That's right. The SQE is the end point for the solicitor apprenticeship programs. Here at BP, we've been running the Solicitor Apprenticeship Programme since 2016, and we've got our first group of apprentices heading towards completion, heading towards the upcoming SQE2 um, assessment. So I've been involved since we, we started running these. Fantastic. So um, what we've got, everybody, is a set of slides that Sam is going to put on the screen now. And we're going to be able to share these slides with you at the end. And I think they're, I think you're going to find them really, really helpful, mainly because it's really, really complicated um, in terms of all the different pathways. They have a lot in common, but um, very subtle differences between them. And what we're going to point out to you are six different pathways um, that you can qualify as a solicitor under the uh, existing and the new regime under the SQE as well. Uh, and what those six pathways are that we're going to go through are um, doing a very quick test preparation course. Um, so you do the SQE 1 exams and the SQE 2 exams, which we meant, mentioned a moment ago. Um, you could do something that is um, preparing you for those assessments, but probably spend more time preparing for those assessments and do additional study as well, which makes you uh, much more uh, career ready or um, um, in that sense. So you have a lot more um, skills, but also a lot more knowledge to go into day one of your time in the office. Um, the third of the pathways is a graduate apprenticeship. That's one where you go typically straight from your university into employment and um, you study, uh, you earn and learn at the same time. Um, and that's something that Bruce will be able to talk about um, with, uh, in a lot of detail as he can do in relation to the solicitor apprenticeship, which is the one where uh, if you're typically 18, just finished your A-levels, you can go straight into practice and spend six years um, in practice. And uh, at the end point of that six years, you are doing the SQE assessments. We're going to look at the option where you've done the LPC, but want to qualify under the qualifying work experience uh, regime, which requires you to do SQE2 on top. And we'll also just reflect on the LPC pathway as well, because there are a number of people who probably can go either way. And indeed, a lot of the questions we've had before this afternoon have uh, been about which pathway should I cover. We'll try and cover as many of those questions and yours as well uh, that you might put in the screen. But just hold your questions back for a moment because we're going to cover a lot of stuff in quite a lot of detail. So before we go through these pathways, Caroline, perhaps you could just give us a bit of an overview as to um, the, the pathway to qualify under the SQ route that's common to all of those routes bar the, S the LPC. Absolutely. I hope my sound's a bit better now as well. I've I've pressed some buttons. Um, oh, I think it is. Well done. Good. Very pleased to hear it. Okay, so... We've got this wheel here. You've got four different things that you need to assemble to get qualified under this SQE regime. So first of all, you need to have a degree. Now, as it says on the slide, it doesn't have to be a law degree. It just needs to be a degree um, or an equivalent qualification. Then you need to have completed both SQE1 
and SQE2. Now, Johnny's already talked a bit about what they consist of. One is broadly knowledge, two is knowledge combined with skills. Um, you must pass both papers of SQE1 before you can even enter yourself for SQE2. So there is a rigid order to be followed there with those SQE exams. Third element Johnny's also talked about a little bit is qualifying work experience, which is a much more flexible concept than we had under the LPC regime. As you can see, um, it's two years similar to the old training contract, but it can be undertaken with up to four different organisations. So that, that gives you very much more scope for, for collecting it from different places. It can take place overseas. Key thing to understand, somebody who is an England and Wales qualified solicitor must sign it off. So if it happens overseas, that's fine, but you'd need to be working for an England and Wales qualified solicitor when you do that. OK, and just a tip as well, the QWE regime is very much run by the Solicitors Regulation Authority and their website's a really good place to look if you're trying to work out exactly what you could use. And it's also where you go to register your QWE to show that you've done it. And then the final thing, I'm sure nobody on this call will have any problems with this, but you do need to be of suitable character in order to qualify as a solicitor. Fantastic. So um, let's now have a look at what SQE1 looks like, just to, uh, I think, refresh a lot of people's memories, but also it might be new to a lot of people. So um, if you're coming to this for the uh, first time, this is for you. But if even if you're not, um, there's quite a lot of detail here. So Bruce, do you want to just start us off, um, kick us off with the first element of SQE1? SQE1, the, the first element, which splits across paper one and, and paper two here, are if you like the, the undergraduate areas of law, what you typically study as the, the core law modules on a, uh, an undergraduate law degree or on a, a PGDL style conversion course. Um, so you have to, to get to grips with the underlying law and be able to uh, remember that and uh, answer multiple choice questions in both of these SQE papers on the underlying law. So that's the, the starting point. And then what comes Added next? For that, you also have to um, cover the areas of practice. These typically were the areas of practice that you would have covered on the LPC uh, and that are comprised in um, an SQE preparation style program. So these five core areas, business law and practice, dispute resolution, property practice, wills and administration of states and um, uh, solicitors accounts comes in there um, as well. Um, and it's worth remembering there's a mix of these areas of practice and areas of law in both papers. So in paper one, you're going to be asked a mix of questions on both contract law, tort law, and dispute resolution as well. So it's almost spanning what you would have studied on a combination of an undergraduate law degree and an LPC under that particular route of qualification. So any LLB graduate, Caroline, needs to dust off their old materials and, um, and retain that knowledge going through the, the, the SQE. Um, Absolutely. That's quite that challenging. Exactly. That's one of the most challenging aspects of this regime. You might have studied contract. Many people do contract in the first year. You might have done contract four years ago or something as you come to these exams. So, yes, part of this is coming in with a plan for how you're going to make sure you're really well up to date. And uh, it's 180 questions on, on uh, each paper. So um, not for the faint hearted. I, I've done a little bit of maths, got out the calculator and worked out it's 1.7 minutes per, per question. Uh, so you don't have much time to to sort of contemplate very much, do you, Bruce? I mean, it's, it's really quite quite quick assessment and then move on, isn't it? There's certainly an art to being able to answer these large multiple choice question papers, uh, a way in which you, you learn to answer the questions. You can answer fairly quickly, park some questions and, and come back to them later. The answer is to do lots of practice to help get yourself prepared and, and ready to deal with that sort of intensive uh, style of exam. So all the more reason for doing a course that you make sure really does prepare you for those central assessments because they're, um, they are quite challenging indeed. So um, this is um, SQE1. Um, let's talk about SQE2 now. Caroline, do you just want to give us a bit of an overview in terms of the uh, what, what's involved here? And you mentioned earlier, this is a combination of some of the knowledge from SQE1 or all of the knowledge, but set in the context of assessing skills as well. Absolutely. And I think a mistake that some people make, it's quite an easy mistake to make, is to think, oh, well, these are the skills assessments. But as you say, Johnny, if you look at that notch in the middle at the top, 
the marks are actually allocated 50-50 between skills and knowledge. Now, it's not absolutely every fragment of knowledge from SQE1, but it's large swathes of it. So you will want to make sure you've kept yourself really up to speed with the work that you've done in SQE1 in preparation for SQE2. And then you're also being um, examined in a mixture of oral skills and written skills. Now, the written skills you see there in purple on the right hand side of the slide are all assessed in a very similar way to SQE1. So they're actually assessed in Pearson View test centres, either in the UK or worldwide. And you sit with a computer in the exam conditions for quite a long time, um, particularly for SQE1. But for SQE2, you have a whole series of tasks that you undertake online in a computer sort of situation in exam conditions. For the oral skills, they're actually assessed face to face. Now, at the moment, we only have three venues for those. That's Cardiff, Manchester and London. Um, we expect there to be more in due course. But a really important thing for anybody who's overseas to understand is you would need to come to England and Wales to be able to do those exams for the oral side of things. Excellent. And um, Bruce, Bruce, what's the level of um, attainment that a, a student has to achieve in order to pass these? Uh, under the LPC, I remember you had it was to be the standard of a day one trainee. What's the level to pass the SQE assessments? And, and this is where the, the SQE is expecting more than the LPC. It's expecting um, day one competence of a newly qualified solicitor. So it is a, a step up in terms of what's expected with these skills assessments compared to the skills assessments on the LPC itself. So yeah. again, all the more reason for doing one of those really comprehensive courses to make sure you're absolutely well prepared for them. I think that you know, we've covered you know, the, the fact that the exams are, uh, they're not inexpensive to take either uh, in, in another session. So we're not going to repeat that, but uh, all the more reason to make sure that you, you get the right choice of preparation from the start and not have to have recess and things like that. OK, so um, we, we said a bit of context in terms of what the SQE is now. And we're going to be talking about you know, how best to prepare for them and which pathways now suit us best. So let us first talk about pathway one, which is um, what's commonly called test preparation, where you just prepare to pass the assessments, uh, SQE1 uh, and SQE2. Um, Bruce, what would be a typical candidate that might just go for a straightforward test preparation, a quick course that just gets you over the line? This, this sort of approach is generally if someone is going to be really confident because they've already done lots of work experience. So they've gained the practical experience. It might be someone who's perhaps got a different type of qualification, come through the, the Chartered Institute of Legal Executives route. Um, could even be somebody who's qualified in, a, in another jurisdiction. That's the sort of audience we're really talking about here. Absolutely. And um, so, Caroline, what, what are the pros, of, uh, the advantages of doing Quick test press tech test. I can't even say it. Put my teeth back in. Uh, quick test preparation um, courses that yeah you know, may take a matter of uh, uh, weeks, a few months, but not yeah you know, a typical bulk of an academic year. What, what's the advantage of doing one of those quick courses? Well, the advantage is is speed and or that you can wrap it around work if you decided you wanted to do it during weekends, for example. So there's flexibility and speed there. And it would also be cheaper than undertaking a more fulsome course. Um, but there are flip sides to that as well, um, which maybe, do you want me to go on to? Yeah, yeah. so what's the, what's, what's yeah. Sort of the, the disadvantages of this particular route? Well, I think, you'd want to be, as Bruce was saying, you'd want to be really confident already that you had a solid background understanding because um, the risk would be if you're simply being given material to go away and, and learn your way, that you just won't get to the standard you need to get to. That That is the risk that you have. Whereas if you have more of a taught program, you have more of a chance to, to see how you are against your peers, to speak to your tutors if maybe um, you're not sure whether you're at the right level, for example. Yeah, good, Bruce, because quite a lot of the programmes out at the moment on the market, some are purely just here's some materials, go go figure, go read. Others are support uh, some online materials. Some have a little bit of tutor support. There's quite a lot of variety out there, isn't there? So, so how do students work out which one is best for them? It's quite a, a high stakes assessment and students really need to, to work out what they want to get out of this preparation 
course and also what how the, the course they're taking would be viewed afterwards is they're going to use their the fact they've taken this course and passed the SQE to apply for a job at a, a law firm how the law firm view the particular route that they've taken to get through the SQE so it's a consideration of what's going to put them in the best position to pass but also what's going to stand them in the best position in the jobs market afterwards as well so actually making this decision as to which pathway you go through and I think it's a very salient point Bruce you've got to be thinking where do I want to be in three five five years time rather than what's the quickest way for me to get over the line to qualify so what why might a student not do pathway one if they're you know what type of career might a student want to go to maybe a more um, considered course um, Caroline well I think if you were looking to a lot of the bigger employers a lot of the bigger law firms a lot of the city firms would expect people's CV to be um, quite well rounded which would include having done well in those sqe exams and to show that they've they've got a really good grounding from the teaching that they've done i mean a, another aspect of this for you is if you have a student or a candidate who um doesn't yet have um qualifying doesn't have a job lined up doesn't have qualifying work experience lined up for themselves with a firm perhaps um, an advantage of doing a fuller course with the university, which we'll come on to in a minute, is things like access to career support and employability support. And that's the kind of thing you wouldn't see on more of a test prep course. Okay, and of course, you know, there are some missing elements within a basic test preparation course um, that are covered in the other uh, more fulsome courses. And for example, Bruce, in the LPC, um, there's a very significant chunk of the LPC that just isn't c covered in the SQE syllabus. So, so what what is that? And um, why would a student, you know, well, why would a student want to disregard doing extra study i suppose or well, what's the incentive in doing the extra study in a more fulsome course so in a, in a more fulsome course and I, I guess at its simplest in relation to the lpc you you generally do a, a set of core modules which roughly align with what you do on the the sqe and then there you do a set of additional modules as well with, with different choices different module options to, to see what you'd like to do in practice and employers out there at the moment who are recruiting uh, or have historically recruited LPC graduates expect those students to come with them with that that broader range of skills and insight into some of these areas of law that aren't necessarily tested as as part of um, SQE so a bit more expert knowledge and you're just not going to get that additional expert knowledge as part of the, the SQE preparation courses that course will be very focused on getting you through the SQE itself and won't go into those broader areas. So what you're saying then Bruce is that the SQE is a, a minimum floor for which you've got to um, pass, but not a, a ceiling, I suppose, of, of, of work and training that you could actually um, go through and to make yourself more employable. Um, one other thing to mention about um, just pure test prep is in terms of funding, of course, as well. Um, some other options, you can get master's funding. Caroline, can you get master's funding for basic short test preparation courses? No, so those would not um, be master's courses. Um, it would need to be a fuller programme of the kind that you guys have just been talking about. We'll talk about a bit more in a second in order to, to qualify, you know, a, a full master's at level seven, as you know, is, is quite a significant academic undertaking and, and a test prep course would not qualify. OK, let's just do um, a quicker overview of what this pathway then looks like for a student. So, um, if you've got a law degree in England and Wales, then um, step that is your first step to be able to to move on to the course. You then would do SQE one, as Caroline said earlier. You have to pass SQE one before you can attempt uh, SQE two. So you do the assessment, then you prepare yourself for SQE two. You do the assessment, and whilst this is all going on, you could be acquiring your two-year qualifying work experience, or you could leave it all to the end after you finished your SQE two. Um, assessments. It's really up to you and you may you may have acquired one year's worth of qualifying work, work experience along the way. If so, you'd only need to do one further um, year um, and outstanding QW to get yourself qualified. So it's really flexible in, in the way that, that Caroline has mentioned there. So lots of pros and cons in relation to that. Just, just pause there. We've been asked um, in the chat I see about um, how BPP's pass rates have been for, for the SQE. That was uh, Ria at uh, 
um, 4.21 p.m. Um, uh, Bruce, I mean, we only had a very, very small cohort take um, the uh, SQE1 assessments from November that were published, I think, in January. But we're very pleased with the results, aren't we? Absolutely. So from BPP, we had a first group of solicitor apprentices go through um, the SQE1 uh, in November last year. Um, and out of the, the 17 apprentices who sat uh, SQE, um, 14 of those passed it first time. Uh, and many of them achieved absolutely excellent results. We're very pleased with how they did. They reported back that it is, as we expected, a, a challenging assessment covering all those different areas of, of law and practice that we've we've looked at. But they, they put a lot of time in into, into practicing, into relearning these areas of law, really getting to grips with the areas of practice and what was going to be expected from them in this assessment. Yeah, and what was the pass rate nationally, Bruce? The nationally published pass rate for all of the candidates taking SQE was 53%, which just goes to show what a challenging assessment it can be. Absolutely. And uh, in contrast, 14 out of the 17 of our apprentices passed both papers. So um, obviously considered to be higher than that, albeit a, a small cohort. But it uh, just shows that if you do the right programme, you put it puts yourself in a better position than one that maybe is a, a test preparation course might be very tempting in the short run because it's cheaper and it's quicker but actually is that doing you any favors in the long run particularly if you don't pass it first time um uh, the answer obviously would, would be not at all okay so let's um let's move on to look at the uh, second pathway which is oh before we do beg your pardon just to talk about non-lawyers because we do need to put that on into context if you are a non-lawyer caroline you mentioned earlier um, you could go straight to do the SQE assessments because there wasn't a requirement that you do a foundation course but um, what would you recommend? Well we strongly recommend that you do undertake you know a law conversion course of some kind we call ours law the uh, law foundations course but there are lots of different versions out there um, because, as we saw from the slide earlier that Bruce talked you through with all those different exam subjects, all in those two columns, um, there's an awful lot of substance to the SQE exams. So we strongly believe you need either a law degree or a conversion course of some sort to give you that foundational law knowledge before you then go on and undertake training for SQE1. Now, I've seen quite a few questions in the chat about whether really you need to bother doing some sort of preparation for the SQE practice subjects. And my answer to that would be, yes, you absolutely do, whether it's a, a very quick test prep thing of the sort that we've just been talking about there, or whether it's a fuller course. Those subjects are not things that you will just know about if you've done some law. You will need to be given training on dispute resolution, property practice, etc. Thank you, Caroline. So um, yeah, the answer is really, we recommend you do a foundations course if you are, or PGDL, GDL, if you're a non-lawyer, it's not mandatory, but you know, I, I would equate it if you, to, if you want to go straight from a non-law degree to step two there to do um, the quick SQE1 prep course, it'd be like you know, rolling up to an advanced driving course, having never even taken a driving lesson in the first place. It just it, it would be madness unless you've got a huge amount of practical experience. Um, so that that would be our recommendation. Certainly, it's the expectation of a lot of law firms as well. So um, let's move on and look at the second pathway, if we could do now, which is um, we talked a little bit earlier about you get students ready for the SQE one and two at an institution like BPP, but we would offer a lot more than that. So what is the added value that BPP and other providers are, are doing with much more fulsome courses than Caroline? Well, we, what we're trying to do is to get the students that come through to a point where they have a really rounded um, understanding of the law, the law as it's practiced and what it's like to be in a law firm so that when they get to the office, they are desk ready as as um, really good, useful trainees stand themselves in fantastic stead when they get to qualification to go forward and have a really good qualification job. So it's 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 aiming for a more rounded um, candidate, basically. Absolutely. And um, 
the sort of things that we were talking about a moment ago, Bruce, some specialist knowledge would be incorporated typically in, in these more fulsome courses, um, a bit like the LPC electors. Can, can you give us some sort of typical examples of what some of those additional modules might be, not necessarily at BPP, but generally what, what practice areas would, would be covered in a more, uh, with that additional career preparation? Often you're talking practice areas that tend to be either a, a commercial or a corporate focus, perhaps the sorts of areas that you, you might want to do if you're looking to work at a, uh, a larger law firm, a city law firm, or, or even a, an international firm. Or there are other areas of law, family law, employment law, um, the sorts of things that there's uh, there's lots of interesting roles out there, but they're just not part of the, the SQE specification. But you're going to put yourself in an advantage in the jobs market if you want to go to that sort of area. And you've done that extra bit of study, you've gained that knowledge, you can hit the ground running to an extent um, if you go into that sort of workplace. Excellent. So for one of these sort of more um, fulsome courses, Caroline, who is the typical um, candidate who would be appropriate for as opposed to maybe the first one, where, which we, the test prep, we were saying, you know, career paralegals, we were talking about maybe foreign qualified lawyers, people who've got a lot of work experience. Who is Pathway 2 more appropriate for, would you say? So this would be more appropriate for people coming out of university, either coming out from their law degree or having come out from their um, non-law degree and deciding they'd like to go in to be a solicitor. It's, it's that kind of student, I think, in particular. Um, and we've, ta we've talked about CV. We've talked about what it looks like to future employers. If you want to be heading towards one of those particularly larger firms, I mean, I think all firms will, will look carefully at what you have done on your CV, but particularly the larger firms, the national, international firms, they will be looking to see that you have that level of experience that you, and that you've shown that commitment to your career, that you've taken on more study than the bare minimum to show that you're a really good candidate for them. Of course. And, and Bruce, um, there is an, an advantage by uh, from a funding perspective for students to go for this pathway, because a lot of um, universities like BPP that are running more fulsome courses do um, or do have that additional funding option. What is that additional funding option if you do one of those more fulsome courses? The advantage of going down this route is the amount of learning involved um, is usually sufficient to, to qualify you for a master's qualification and if you're gaining a master's qualification through your SQE1 and SQE2 prep and the, this additional, these additional modules to help you get you ready for your intended career then you can use master's funding to fund that particular um, academic course so that, that is a real benefit of this route. And that's a quite substantial amount, isn't it, uh, Carol? I think it's £11,836. It's not going to pay for everything, but it's going to pay for a large chunk of, of the course. And of course, it makes you more employable by having that additional learning, extra skills coverage, and, and probably more sp time spent preparing for the central assessments as well. Um, certainly at BBP, we would spend more time preparing students for the central assessments for SQ1 and 2 than a, a quick test prep course. So probably giving you greater chance to pass those exams and having that additional career preparation as well. So um, what, what are the disadvantages then, um, Caroline, of, of going down this pathway number two? Well, of course, it takes longer if you're doing more learning um, and it costs more if you're doing more learning. Those are the two key ones, really. But really what people have to do is to sit back and think, is, is it worth the investment of my time? Is it worth the investment of my cash? Particularly if you can get some help to ease your way through with that master's funding, that can that can help tip the balance for a lot of people who are self-funding. Absolutely. And uh, let's just have a look um, at the pathway in terms of an overview. So we've got our law degree people, step one. So once you've got your law degree, you go and do this more fulsome SQE1 test prep course, you do the assessment, and obviously it will take a little bit longer than the test prep courses, but for the reasons we said, it does have its advantages. Then you'd probably spend a bit more time preparing for SQE2, do the assessment, and then normally at the end of this whole block of learning, you would have this additional career preparation where you would typically spend maybe um, certainly at BPP, we, we would be spending uh, another term really focusing on those specialist practice areas and enhanced skills to prepare you for day one in the workplace. Um, so that's 
what we're doing from a studying perspective. But of course, um, whilst you are undertaking that study, you could be doing your qualifying work experience, building that up. And obviously step seven, if you haven't, by the time you finished all the assessments and all the course, still got to make up the two years, you can do the balance then. One question came in from the chat actually, Bruce. And um, Does the two years have to be consecutive or can it be broken up into sort of little pieces as long as it's spread across four employers? Yes, it can be broken up in, into different segments. So some of it can be earlier, some of it can be later. And that's one of the, uh, the benefits of this new route to qualification. It is that much more flexible. Yeah, so you could earn some money, doing your qualifying work experience the money you're earning is funding your sqe1 and then maybe going to practice for a bit more save some money and then do sqe2 so it's, there's so many different flexible ways to do it that uh, um i mean and my advice with students when considering pathway number two really is you only invest once in your career um when it comes to this vocational training um why not give yourself the best shot of being employed it certainly puts you on a level playing field with um, the LPC candidates that have, have had a more fulsome training, um, whereas step number one, as, as, as we've already heard, might actually put you slightly behind the eight ball because you haven't had that enhanced skills and knowledge training. But it just depends on where you are in your career. Um, final point, uh, Caroline, in terms of the non-lawyers um, for this particular pathway, is it the same position in terms of what we recommend in terms of doing a foundations course before you do the SQE? Absolutely, because actually, although we've been drawing distinctions between pathway one and pathway two, fundamentally, they both have that same SQE one and SQE two exam sort of milestones in them, which means that the same applies. Absolutely. So recommended, but um, it is optional according to the S uh, SRA, but a lot of law firms would, would require their future trainees who are non-lawyers to, to undertake that platform in, in the foundations of law. Let's move on and look at graduate apprenticeships, um, Bruce. Um, this is uh, your baby, of course. Um, um, we've got uh, two lots of apprenticeships we're going to talk about now. So um, do you just want to give it a bit of an outline of, of, of what a graduate apprenticeship looks like and um, I think we'll probably do that with the aid of the slides probably it's probably easier just to reflect that so what happens if you're a, a law graduate yeah so I suppose I should start just with a, a brief explanation of what an apprenticeship is an apprenticeship yeah. is simply a job combined with a program of study so if you're applying for an apprenticeship program you're applying to the legal employer for a job as a graduate solicitor apprentice and then you are spending 20 percent of your working time so typically one day a week on, on day release doing the learning to help you get ready to take the sqe so you're doing a program of learning to get you ready to pass the solicitor's qualifying exam so the, the idea of the graduate solicitor apprenticeship is it's suitable for someone who's already done a law degree or who's already done uh, the PGDL style conversion course so you've got the areas of law under your belt you're familiar with those but you need to do the final stages you need to do the same practice area modules um, that we, we highlighted earlier um, that are, are covered on in SQE 1 so you can use the graduate apprenticeship to give you the learning that you need to cover those practice modules so they'll pick up during the course of well, how long typically would a graduate apprenticeship be from when the student starts to when they they're qualified so by the time they got through all the sqe1 and sqe2 assessments uh, the graduate solicitor apprenticeship is is typically somewhere around 30 months long um so that that builds into it the uh, the idea that you would do two years of qualifying work experience as well as have uh, a day release study day uh, across that period to, to complete the preparation you need for SQE. Thank you and well, what's the position with regard to non-lawyers so non-law graduates going would they be able to go straight on to a graduate apprenticeship or would their law firms require them to do a foundations course first? It, it's very difficult to envisage a situation where a law firm would want to accept somebody onto a graduate apprenticeship without that person having done a foundations course before. Like the, the driving test analogy you used earlier, it's very difficult to, to study uh, wills and estates on a graduate solicitor apprenticeship 
without having studied trust law earlier on. It's very difficult to, uh, to understand the practice of dispute resolution unless you've learned about contract law and tort law. And again, I think the, the employer expectation is you've, you've done that learning, that training in a uh, relatively sort of formal setting rather than just um, doing it on a, a self-study basis if that firm is going to sponsor you through the graduate apprenticeship. Good. There's a question just coming from Samantha. Ben, could, uh, sorry, Sam, could you just put it on the, the screen? Samantha's question just coming in at 4.39. What's the level of salary like um, for a graduate apprenticeship? I mean, should, should we be looking at this, Bruce, in a similar vein to training contract salaries or, or, or is, there a, a, is there like to be a distinction? No, absolutely. And that is the ideal comparison to make so the salary that is paid and it definitely is paid samantha is um uh, it's at the discretion of the the employer there's a, there's a minimum uh, apprentice salary but the the employers paying a um a graduate solicitor apprentice will usually um match that salary to the salary of a trainee solicitor if you're talking 30 months for the graduate apprenticeship that's roughly equivalent to the, the two years that you do on a training contract so often you get a year one trainee salary then it steps up to a year two trainee salary and of course um because you're doing the studying as you go along it's not study then work it's, it's this simultaneous um hybrid um that uh, i suppose um Caroline, there'll be some students uh, that this will be appropriate for, some learners that this type of model will be appropriate for, and others maybe less would be less keen on this model. So what are the advantages of going down the graduate apprenticeship route, would you say? Well, I mean, the money side, I think, is <laughs> that you've already touched on there. The fact that you're actually getting a salary from the start for some people will be really important. Um, and just getting... To be part of a firm earlier, I think, for some people, is a really attractive option. Um, it's um, in a way you're quite like a trainee, aren't you? I mean, you've just been talking about that. You're quite like um, somebody who is um, on the more traditional route, but uh, just in in the framework of an apprenticeship. Absolutely, and then um, we've got to look at these on a, on a, on a and parallel with training contracts because you have to go through an application process like a training contract application process is it the same sort of candidates that we're seeing that um the and the same sort of firms that um sponsor students that are offering graduate apprenticeships bruce or is it much more is it much wider or how do you see it going in the future yes I mean, graduate solicitor apprenticeships are still um a fairly new thing whilst it's the longer version of solicitor apprenticeships have been running for five to six years now. Graduate apprenticeships have, have really started to, to gain awareness out there with employers over the last couple of years. Um, and some employers are offering it as instead of the training contract route and some employers are looking to offer it alongside the training contract route. So it's going to be a growing market. Um, Often you'll find that um, law firms may recruit six to 12 months in advance for, for their graduate programs. If they are offering a graduate apprenticeship, that ought to be clear from, from their website and what their recruitment team is offering. But actually the, the interview, the assessment center process you would go through would be very similar to that of uh, somebody applying for a training contract. Fabulous. And um, in terms of graduate apprenticeships, Certainly from my perspective, I can see it not just being something that the top law firms sponsor students for. I can see a lot of the smaller and medium sized firms picking up on this because from a funding perspective, um, in a lot of senses, they've they've already paid for, for the course because they've, they, they pay this apprenticeship levy, don't they, Bruce? So um, if you're a career paralegal, it might be worthwhile having a conversation with your employer and say, actually, if you want to get me qualified and charge me out a higher rate, make me more experienced, why not redeem some of those apprenticeship levy vouchers and, and pay for a course for me to do to qualify? Is that something that you can see as a, a development area going forward? Absolutely. And, and that's something that's, that's starting to, to happen quite a, a lot now, uh, where we have inquiries from people already working in practice. And sometimes it's it's the paralegal who finds out about the apprenticeship route and, uh, and sells it and talks to their employer about it and, and raises their awareness of exactly how it could work. Either the law firm uh, pays into the, the levy so the course can be fully funded from levy, um, or if their particular employer does not pay the apprenticeship levy, it depends on the size of their, their payroll, then 
the employer pays 5% of the cost of the training and the rest is met by the rest of the cost is met by the government from a central pot of apprenticeship funding so actually this opens up the chance to fund training through to qualification for solicitors to a whole range of smaller and medium sized employers who just simply wouldn't have the training budget available to help people through the LPC. So it's a, it's a real route to, to widening participation uh, to, to gain qualification as a solicitor. And that's one of the main aims of the new uh, SQE route was to widen participation. We can certainly see that this this uh, is going to act as a catalyst to to have a lot of the career paralegals that may have done the LPC, but for one reason or another couldn't get qualified. Uh, it will allow them to get qualified, which is obviously great news. So if I could stick with you, Bruce, for the um, the fourth pathway, you mentioned a moment ago the solicitor apprenticeship, and uh, it's probably best uh, reflected in, in the um, in the a little flow chart we've got here. Do you just want to explain what this uh, solicitor apprenticeship is? And I'll click through the slides at an appropriate moment. Yes. Yeah, so, so this solicitor apprenticeship, we're, what we're looking at here for, for this version of this apprenticeship is typically a, a six year program. And it's really intended for someone who has not done a law degree. In fact, if you've done a, a law degree, you wouldn't be eligible for this because you covered too much of the, the learning. So the idea of the solicitor apprenticeship, the six year version, is you would spend the first four years uh, covering the core areas of law, typically what you do in years one and two of a, a full time law degree, the same things you do on a, uh, a graduate conversion course. You're still on an apprenticeship, you're still working in a law firm over the four years you're doing those areas of law, you're four days in the business gaining experience, and then you're being released one day a week to do your study. And then in years five and six, you're, you're effectively doing the graduate apprenticeship bit. You're doing the, the practice area modules that you need to add on and combine with those areas of law that you've been studying in years one to four. And throughout this six years, you're gaining all of that experience. So you're gaining much more, actually, than the, the two years qualifying work experience that you need. Again, it's all funded through the, the apprenticeship levy. So that's that's paid by the, the employer's levy. There's no cost to the individual um, apprentice going down this particular route. This is a lot more well established. There are lots more firms out there offering the solicitor apprenticeship on a, on a six year version. It's really intended perhaps for people coming uh, as, a, as a school leaver and looking for an alternative to going to university, someone who wants to to get, uh, get started with working straight away. And you can imagine once somebody gets towards the end of this program, they've been in the business for, for five or six years, um, they, they've gained a great deal of, of insight uh, and they're really doing some very interesting work too. Yeah, I think it would be fair to say that somebody who's done assisted apprenticeship and got through to the end is probably slightly more experienced or probably quite a bit more experienced than the typical graduate who's just done two years worth of qualifying work experience. Yes, and what we're hearing as feedback from, from some law firms is actually by the time somebody gets to uh, year four, year five of, of this six year program, it's it's difficult to, to remember they, they haven't actually, they're not actually a graduate as yet. Um, they can be doing work that you might expect of or, uh, a newly qualified or somebody who's a couple of years qualified because they've had that, that practical experience for, for so many years. And actually, it's, it's not a required part of the solicitor apprenticeship, but certainly BP, other providers as well, will incorporate a, a degree as part of it as well. So even though you're going down an apprenticeship route, you're also ending up as a graduate as well. So you're on an equal footing uh, in the jobs market later on. Thank you so much. Um, lots of questions uh, coming coming through. Um, uh, I think people are confused between what we mean by training contract, QWE and graduate apprenticeship and EV, you're not the only person. I think we'll we'll, we'll sweep that up at the end because um, there's a lot of information here we're giving you and hopefully um, when we give you the link to the slides, you can go away and study them in your own time. Maybe rewatch this back on, on Legal Cheap's website because there is a lot of information here we're giving you. Uh, as I said earlier, it, it's very complicated out there. So, um, Caroline, talk me through pathway number five. Um, so somebody does the LPC and then they do SQE2. Um, what does that look like in terms of um, the qualification process then? 
so this is this is a bit of a hybrid which is is permitted under this effectively as a transitional measure under this um under this new regime but as you've already mentioned johnny for people for example who maybe have done the lpc and have been paralegaling and haven't managed to get themselves a training contract yet this can be a really great route to qualification so you've undertaken your degree your law degree or your conversion of course you needed to have that to be able to do an lpc then you've been undertaking qualifying work experience you may well already have two years which can be signed off right now and that's the position we've got for quite a lot of people who are approaching us about sqe2 because the way that you can get yourself to qualification in that circumstance is to undertake the sqe2 assessment so undertake and pass those sqe2 assessments um, and that will get you to where you need to be now a big health warning here is remember we talked about the fact the SQE2 assessments involve both knowledge and skills. And there's important things to understand about both of those things if you come at this as an LPC graduate. On the knowledge side, you will have covered all of the material in broad terms that will be assessed in SQE2 as the law material, but what you learnt on your degree will not have been targeted at the SQE. So it may be, um, doesn't cover quite the right areas and quite the right detail. It may be a bit out of date. So what you will need to do as an LPC graduate as part of preparing for SQE2 is to get yourself refreshed in all of that law and all of that practice knowledge and make sure it's up to date. Second thing to say, now we've touched on this already, but I think it's really important to emphasize is that those skills that you do on the LPC are day one trainee level. SQE2 is day one newly qualified level. So you're being held to quite a lot higher standard. The other thing to say on top of that is that the way they've put together SQE2 skills is a particular way of assessing the particular skills. And it's different, it's quite different in some cases from the way that they were assessed on the LPC. So if you're somebody who's coming in and you're thinking this route is the one for you, it may well be, but please don't take it lightly because there will be things that you will need to get sorted out to get yourself ready to sit SQE2. Great stuff. And um, of course, the point is you can pick up your qualifying work experience as soon as you've finished your LPC. So if you've been paralegaling after your LPC for a year or two, you may well have clocked up your qualifying work experience. And even if you've done, let's say, a year, year and a half, you could still pick up any outstanding QWE after you've done your SQE2 and get yourself qualified. So again, much more flexible way. The downside of that, Bruce, um, must be cost, I suppose. Yes, yes, it's still going to be expensive. You you need to, to fund the cost of your SQE2 preparation course and, and the cost of the SQE2 exam itself. And, and it, we're typically talking about a shorter SQE2 prep course here. So there, there won't be master's funding for that. Yeah. And I think um, in terms of um, Sylvia's question, I think uh, Caroline went quite some way to explain that the skills are similar, but they're assessed in a different way uh, on the SQE2 assessments compared to the LPC. So you'll find in terms of the headline skills, a lot of them are similar, like you know, advocacy and interviewing and advising and uh, legal research. But actually, the way that they're assessed is, is very different. But that's for another time in terms of that detail. So we've got about seven or eight minutes to go now. Um, and um, in terms of you know, the cost of SQE prep courses, Sylvia, they are, they'll, they'll range from next to nothing to quite expensive. And it will really depend on how much the level of detail you want to go into in the course for the reasons we've discussed. Um, so there isn't a single price for the actual course. It depends where you go the, and the extent of the course you want to do. So um, pathway number six, um, the LPC, our old friend, the LPC then, Caroline, just take us through who would do the LPC and um, who can still do the LPC. Mm, that's the key thing to understand. So some of the people on this call will be eligible to do the LPC if that's what they choose. Some of you will not because the regime changed September last year. And basically, depending where you were in your law journey at that time, you either will or will not have the option to do the LPC. So anybody at this stage can do the SQE route. That's totally fine. But if you want to pursue the LPC route, uh, you need to basically have embarked on your legal journey by September last year. 
in very broad terms. Now, there's more detail on the SQ, SRA's SQ website on exactly how that applies to people. So I'm not going to go into absolute detail there. But say you had started a law degree um, in 2020, you absolutely would be somebody who would be able to benefit from the LPC regime. So if you did that, you would complete your law degree or you would complete your conversion course. This position would be slightly different in terms of dates for people who've converted. And then from there, you would go in and the LPC, quite a different beast from the SQE because the LPC is a course you are obliged to do if you if you pursue that route. So you go in with your law degree or your conversion, you study a combination of practice subjects and skills and more in-depth practice subjects, so specialist subjects, over the course of, for a full time, or it's about nine months, so it's about an academic year. Um, and that will then take you on to needing to do a training contract. But of course, option five, pathway five is shown. You could potentially, if you needed to, use the QWE route at that point and go in um, and do SQE2. So um, this is a purer route. If you, This is basically the old route, what we've got on this slide here. But you could swerve onto pathway five if you needed to. If you're, if you're tempted to do the LPC, I suggest the first thing you do is to go to the SRA's SQE website and work out whether that is an option for you, whether you're eligible yeah. for that. Yeah, and basically, I think that just to sort of just slightly expand on what Caroline said, um, you have to have started your law journey by 31st of December last year, but you have to have accepted your offer on the course by the September date that, that Caroline mentioned. So um, for all intents and purposes, if yeah, most students who started an LLB in 2021 will probably still be eligible to go down the LPC route. But you've got to ask yourself in three or four years time when you come to thinking about training contracts, will there be as many training contracts around as there are now? And actually, they will be going down in number, but there's still quite a lot, you know, quite a lot out there. But um, Bruce, um, how, have many firms committed yet to the SQE in uh, 2022, as far as you're aware? I think law firms are, are waiting to see um, how the SQE pans out and the, the LPC has been a tried and tested route for, for many years and some law firms are, are moving towards the, the new system which is going to apply to everybody in the future, the SQE system, sooner rather than later. Others uh, have decided perhaps to wait to introduce SQE type programs until 2023, just to, to give it another sort of 12, 18 months. So everybody gets a bit more familiar with the newer SQE route. But it, it does seem to be gaining increasing traction as, uh, as, as each month goes by. Yeah, there are still LPC contract training contracts out there but um they're, they'll be diminishing year on year over the course of the next few years so i think if you're a first year probably most first years will end up going down the sqe route whereas it, it'll be um there'll be many more students still doing the lpc probably in september 22 than in september 23 certainly Great stuff. So um, that really gives you the overview of those six pathways. And um, I'm really grateful for the num many number of questions that have come in to the chat boards here. It's, it's a good job that we've got the networking session afterwards because there's a lots and lots of questions that we still need to answer. Just to reassure you, we will go through those questions and add to the FAQs on Legal Chief's website um, with those questions that are uh, frequently asked that aren't already covered there. But um, if I could just maybe pick uh, one or two questions that came in earlier, because I did promise I would do. Um, could we look at question 18, um, Sam, and just put that on the screen if you could do. Question 18 uh, was from Harry from Nottingham Trent University, which was a really good question. Um, what he said was, if I complete my GDL and I'm unable to secure a training contract, what route is the best option to take in order to progress towards becoming a qualified solicitor? So you completed your law conversion course, so effectively got yourself to the same position as a law graduate. Um, is it best to go down the LPC route or the the uh, SQE route, a graduate apprenticeship? I mean, is, is there a single answer to that, Caroline? I'm afraid there isn't. I'd love it if it was. It'd be much simpler, wouldn't it? But there isn't a single answer to that. Um, we've talked about a lot of the factors here. I mean, the market is moving towards the SQE. So there is, to a degree, there is, I think, an attractiveness in having 
the more up-to-date qualification, particularly if you're struggling to get a training contract. Because remember, if you can get paralegaling, you can count that as QWE, which will help you get towards being a qualified solicitor. But I mean, I'll hand over to Bruce on the apprenticeship side. For somebody in your position, the apprenticeship could be a good option. Absolutely. I've seen various questions coming in the chat about sponsorship for, for SQE and the apprenticeship route is, is effectively a, a sponsored route and sponsorship not only for your programme of study, but sponsorship for, for the payment of the cost of the SQE exam mm. itself. So there's, there's perhaps not as many graduate apprenticeship solicitor opportunities out there at the moment as there, there are training contracts, um, but it is a fully sponsored route. And uh, we'll think, well, just before we uh, put up the link into the chat, uh, Sam, for the slides, um, if we could just copy over question 22 from Jack, uh, who's at Manchester University. Um, Jack was saying, will the LPC or SQE route look better in the eyes of employers, considering the LPC is already established in terms of its content and, and preparation for life as a solicitor? Um, Caroline, over to you, maybe for your first take on that one. Yeah, I mean, different employers are taking a different approach, I think it's fair to say. But I also think quite a lot of employers don't really mind. Um, if you come to them as a really good candidate, it doesn't actually really matter too much. They will mould you as they want you in due course. If you go to them prior to your training, they may well prescribe the route that you go. In fact, a lot of the bigger employers will do that, in which case it takes the, take the decision out of your hands. But I don't think you are going to be prejudicing yourself one way or the other by deciding to go one route or the other, provided you're happy that what you're pursuing is a good option for you. I think that's right. The one caveat I'd say, though, is if you're going to choose the SQE route, if you want to put yourself in the more or less the same position as an LPC graduate with that body of learning, look at option two rather than option one, which is that more fulsome uh, SQE preparation course without, um, with, you know, without having all that specialist knowledge. It does put you at a, at a disadvantage in relation to some employers who may or may not look at you. It just depends. It will vary from, from firm to firm. Well, we've ticked round to um, five o'clock, everybody, and um, I, I just want to thank Caroline and Bruce for uh, that. That hour has ticked by very quickly, hasn't it? Um, and and if if Sam, could you put the link up? I think uh, my colleague Anna sent uh, sent you the the link to the slides. Uh, maybe you could pin that to the chat. That would be great, um, so students could take that away with them, um, and maybe we could pin it to the breakout room. Um, and I think I'll probably will welcome back. Thanks. Uh, you've done that now, Sam. Uh, welcome back Aisha now, who will explain what's going to happen next. Fab, thank you very much, Johnny, Caroline and Bruce for that excellent discussion. I'm sure the students and the audience have plenty to take away from that. Um, so we're now going to move on to the networking where you can follow up with Johnny, Caroline and Bruce. I saw lots of questions coming through in the chat and this is your chance to have those all answered. So this takes place in the expo until 6 p.m. and you can see it highlighted in red in your left sidebar. So speakers, thanks again for joining us today. If you could now make your way to the expo and enter your Meet the Speakers booth, that would be great. Thank you. So we click return and go into the expo that way, Bruce. That's right. Fantastic. Fab. Now, just as a reminder, a recording of today's session will be made available a month from today in the SQE hub on Legal Cheek. And we'll drop a link um, to, to that in the chat for you now. Um, just, just keep that handy for reference um, and also to be to be kept up to date with um, all things SQE. Um, but for now, it's time to network. Um, so head over to the expo in the left sidebar. There's just one booth in the expo, that's to meet the speakers. And that's where Johnny, Caroline and Bruce are all waiting to answer all your questions. Um, we do ask that you share your audio and video when you enter the expo. Um, it's just a nice way to put a face to a name. But there is also the option to um, leave your questions in the chat sidebar as you've been doing during the discussion. So that's a wrap on the panel discussion. Head over now to the networking. Um, I'm going to do that now myself and I hope to see you all over there.